TFM. Welcome, stargazers. All you stargazers out there, too. Another episode of Interphase, our Star Trek Universe podcast. It's been a while since we've done this show, but we are back. And today, we're going to be talking about Star Trek Picard. I'm Christopher Jones, and with me is my esteemed co-host from many shows on the network, Matthew Rushing. And Matthew, I've got to say, you are looking absolutely positronic today. Well, I appreciate that, Chris. You know, uh, I just figured I would just artificially tango my way in here. And uh, <laughs> it's, uh, you know, you got to look good when you do the tango. You, you got to be wearing something nice. And uh, so I figured that I would make that happen for this episode as, you know, I'm I'm actually really excited to be diving into um, Star Trek Picard. In fact, I think the last time I talked about Star Trek Picard on a podcast, we did the first half of the season mm-hmm. on the Ready Room like years ago now. A long time like. ago. Yeah. And um, yeah, uh, you know, this is this is a new season. And honestly, uh, I'm I'm not going to leave anybody hanging, but this episode has me hooked for season two. It is a great episode. I'm looking forward to talking about it. And that was a great transition, Matthew, there with the artificial tango weaning your way <laughs> into the show, because if you're listening, you may be listening to this episode in the feed for Interphase. You may be listening to this episode in the feed for The Line, which has been our Star Trek Picard podcast for season one. We're actually retiring the line with huge thanks to everyone who hosted that show. I want to say thank you to everyone who provided coverage of season one for our audience. We're going to be retiring the line. We're renaming the show moving forward, The Artificial Tango, which is a name that I feel better encompasses the story that we ended up with in season one with the androids and Picard and Data and where he is now. And this kind of artificial history that we're going into here, and the little tango with Q. That's a quick background to the show and the transition that we're doing here. But Matthew, let's start talking about the actual episode, The Star Gazer. I love the title. I thought it was very clever. And I also loved seeing the Star Gazer itself again. Of course, not Picard's, but an updated one, with a little homage to the original with its registry number. Absolutely, Chris. Um, you know, I couldn't agree with you more. There was, uh, I would say, so much to love about this episode. And, and in all honesty, I think one of the biggest things that we should probably dig into was just the fact that where we're going to go in this season, aside from, you know, the crazy time travel aspect we all know is coming, this episode, at least, I think makes the promise to us that we are finally going to use the opportunity in the show called Star Trek Picard to really dig into Picard himself and a couple really important things in the fact that one of the places that Picard has never actually explored, he's explored outward, he's just never explored inward. And so this show, it feels like they are promising to us that in some ways, unlike the first season, we are actually going to really focus on this main character and get into what makes him tick and what has kept him alone for all of these years, the why for that, and maybe, just maybe, help this man explore that inward nature, that human condition that Gene Roddenberry liked to talk about, which is what's going on inside, so that we can allow the character to move forward in all ways. And to me, that was really encompassed by the fact that we start this episode with Laris declaring her love for Picard and saying, I want to be with you and him being unable to let her in. As we have seen many, many times with Picard and over the years, whether that's Beverly, whether that's um, and I cannot remember her the name, the top of my head, um, but the the woman that 
he played music with uh, mm-hmm. there in TNG. It's been a very long time since I've seen that episode, so I just can't remember her name. You know, he's, uh, you know, you even think of, you mentioned Insurrection, you think of Anish, you know, uh, mm-hmm. and really maybe even letting her in. He's had this successive line of people that are there for a season, but they're only going to be temporary. And so I love the way that we start this episode by really confronting his biggest problem, which is his inability to move forward with his life in this aspect of personal relationships. Right, right. Yeah, like you say, it's not that he doesn't, I think, have a desire to be with someone, but there's something creating a barrier. And you definitely see it here with Laris because he comes very close, but he just can't take that final step. And then later we get the, you know, on the nose discussion that he has with Guinan, where she goes into full counselor mode. But, you know, Guinan probably knows him better than anyone. We We haven't gotten that many stories about their connection, but it's always been implied. And of course, we know from Time Zero that they've known each other since the 1800s. And she knows him maybe perhaps better than anyone. And she asks him flat out what's going on. And it's time to explore what's inside. There's a hint here that something happened with his mother with his parents that mm-hmm. apparently I took it especially on the rewatch of the episode to be the hint of what happened because Guinan asks him what happened in there mm-hmm. that created this barrier for you talking about his heart and I took that to mean like he asks his mother like will he find us here and there's this these mm-hmm. violent flashbacks of what, what happened and I feel like at least to some extent, that might be what created the the barrier, the fear for him, the fear that if he let someone into sure. his life, that the same thing would happen to him. Not literally mm-hmm. exactly the same thing, but that conflict, right? That, that sorrow. Right. I, I mean, I, I think you're absolutely right in the sense that we get the sense in this episode that Picard's family life was horrible that his father was abusive in some way, and it not only affected Picard and his brother, which really helps explain the episode family Mm -hmm. and why they have such a hard time with one another. But also, um, I think it really does help explain this whole idea, you know, her telling him to look up at the stars and basically that they'll drown out the noise that he hears when his parents are fighting Having grown up with parents who fought and hearing that in the middle of the night, it can be very Mm -hmm. disturbing as a child. So I had some, I mean, this episode did some things to me inside as I was watching it is remembering some things. Um, But Picard, then he, he is running away. He is not going out to explore strange new worlds and seek out new life and new civilization. Picard is literally trying to get his mind off of something that happened to him and he's never dealt with that. And he has a fear of that inner life in many ways, I think, because, and whether it's truly rational or not, it's been there for so long now that is entrenched that he feels as though he cannot let somebody in Mm -hmm. um, because in, in many ways he has not been able to let go. And Chris, I, I wanted to ask you, obviously we're huge Niners. Yeah. And not San Francisco 49er fans, but, well, well I you mean, are, but yeah, <laughs> um, but a uh, deep space Niners and in many ways, were you struck by the fact that Picard's problem here is that he is stuck in a moment and he can't get out again? <laughs> like <laughs> he is stuck in that same moment of basically being that child who is fearful of what his father may do to him and his mother and being stuck in that moment has um, arrested, developed him in a way that has not allowed him to actually have a full life when it comes to the relational aspect of his life. And I was really struck by that in some ways he is so much more similar to Cisco than we ever knew before. You too picked up on that. 
I see. Yes, um, yeah, I did. It's a, <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a good point. There are those similarities, and it affected me too. I, I guess watching this, I maybe connect with Picard's inner feelings more than I ever have in the past because I've always seen him as a very closed off person, but. Mm -hmm. Knowing that this stuff happened to him in his childhood, uh, growing up, and how it affected him, connected with me, because I kind of have the same problem. You know, I had, like you mentioned, you had parents who fought, and you heard that, and I did as well. And my parents were divorced many times between the two of them, and so I was around a lot of different situations with uh, step parents and such, and mm -hmm. lots of fighting, lots of turmoil, and it also it didn't affect me to the extent of Picard, where I decide, oh, I can't let someone into my life. But it certainly affects how I act because I want to guard against that type of thing. Mm -hmm. I want to avoid conflict. I want to avoid fighting, and uh, sometimes you can take those feelings to an extreme and they're actually detrimental to you, even though you're trying to avoid any type of conflict. And so I felt that. And then in Picard's situation, perhaps he took it to the extreme to to av avoid mm -hmm. any problem for himself. Just don't ever let anyone in. Mm -hmm. And it explains a lot. If you go back to the next generation, we're always wondering, like, why doesn't Jean-Luc and Beverly, why don't they get together? Mm -hmm. You know, they obviously yep. have this bond and there are these moments where they kind of do just for a moment and it never materializes. And I guess before we get to the end of this, we probably should talk about the fact that Beverly's not around in Picard's future. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, if you at want. least here. Yeah it, yeah, it does very much seem as though when he's talking to Guinan, he kind of references that idea that that ship has sailed. Basically, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and that's where I think she does a great job of challenging him and saying, this mm -hmm. is not about time. This is about you. Yeah, right. And, yeah. you know, the fact that basically you've been drowning out the screams among the stars and never really dealing with the reality of what happened to you and that inability to dig deep inside. And with the help of others, like, you know, uh, this isn't just something you can do for yourself, but, you know, to actually basically he's had Troy, who's been a counselor in his life, you know, like to mm -hmm. actually deal with these issues, because that's exactly what this man needs. He needs, uh, you know, they do a root canal, but he needs a heart canal, right? He needs to dig in to his heart and be able to work through these issues. And, and he has been unwilling to do that. And. I think what's fascinating is that this show, too, in in, some, in in a way that it did not do in season one, but it's doing here, is using Seven of Nine as an interesting mirror for Picard because, really, she's in the same position that Picard is in that because of the fear that people have when they see her on the outside with the Borg implants and everything, that what's happened with the Borg, I mean, she and Picard have both arrested, developed themselves on purpose to keep from moving forward because of the fear they have of moving forward. And so I think this is a really... Season one did not really do a, a great job, I think, of, of legitimizing why Seven of Nine was mm -hmm. there. Yeah, But I, I think this season, even in this first episode, has legitimized why both of these characters are here because they legitimately have the same problem in many ways and the solution is going to be the hard work of digging in emotionally and and helping themselves become better and the willingness to do so um and it's also something that i think you know the audio drama that um, mike johnson and kirsten byer did kind of alludes to this fact for seven of nine uh, as well so if you haven't checked that out i would highly encourage you to listen to it because it's something that really i think enhances this season uh, coming into this i was thinking about that audio drama and the situation between rafi and seven and basically picard and laris as well as rafi and seven 
they're in the same position. There's yeah. one person who yeah. wants to be committed and the other person can't quite make the commitment. And I'm I'm so excited to be able to really dig into two great characters and finally flesh them out and make that hopefully an opportunity for them to to truly grow. Yeah. And the fact that they both have this connection to the collective, having both been Borg drones, in Picard's case for a very short time and in a different role, but at least he knows what that experience is like. Mm -hmm. And of course, Seven was for a very long time and, and still has remnants of being a Borg there. The scene where the Borg ship comes out of the anomaly and Picard and Seven are both looking at it on the view screen and Picard just looks at her and then she says, yeah, it's a Borg mm -hmm. ship. You know, that moment too, you felt like with everyone who was on the bridge, everything going on around them, the two of them were in like a special bubble together, like mm -hmm. a special connection I felt. And, and it's yeah. very subdued, but it, like you said, it made sense. It makes sense for her to be in this story and the discussion that they have when they're in, I I don't know if that was Rios's ready room because it looked quite small and cramped to be a ready room, but they're all around this table Actually, you know, talking. Actually, that is the um, observation lounge at the back. Um, so okay. it's a smaller That's observation right. lounge. I, I, think, I think the thing that made that really interesting is that um, – the Stargazer looks bigger because of the force perspective than it actually mm -hmm. is. Um, John Eves was talking about this, I think, on Facebook because he's back working with, and you can tell he's back working with, thank mm -hmm. God, and helping make these starships look like Star Trek ships again. And maybe that's something we can talk about here, but the force perspective makes it look like a larger ship than it actually mm -hmm. is. And so I think the Stargazer is maybe half the size of a of a. A sovereign class ship and so okay. the so fact that it has uh, i i'm and I'm, I'm guessing i'm sure fans will write us if i'm wrong because that's what the internet's for um, well this is but, all new to everybody so exactly we're all we're all just starting to figure out what's going on in this new stargazer but i do think i, I do think that this is it it seems larger but it's actually a a, mm -hmm. a, a smaller ship like the stargazer was itself originally yeah that makes and, sense um that makes sense Plus, it's an experimental ship, right? She mentions that it's a new class of ship with a technology from the artifact from season one. And maybe with an experimental ship like that, too, it makes sense to be a mm -hmm. somewhat smaller yeah, ship. You know, Voyager was a small ship compared with the 1701D yes. and other ships of the time. So, Well, in, in all honesty, all of these ships that show up have been given this... This is a part of a new fleet that they've been creating. And mm -hmm. so that's what, you know, of course, makes this end so uh, damaging with the Borg coming and everything is that they're taking over the ship. And so, yeah, I think this is just honestly really, really fascinating mm -hmm. stuff. And, and you know, just to say, I personally am very thankful that they did this with the ships. I, I appreciate, one, the callbacks for the names I appreciate the look of the ships looking very much more like Star Trek, but if you know, they, they've, it, it looks like things have grown a little bit, you know, they still look a little bit more like the Kelvin universe in some ways, but the, they also have yeah. a look that feels very similar to the 24th century tr track, which I appreciate. Right. So it, all I'm trying to say is thank you for making history of Star Trek seem important again. It, yeah. it really came yeah. through. So, Well, there's a lot of that. Uh, the little touches, everything from the red alert graphic that we see, which I know that yep. that one's been used on, I believe on Discovery, they used it as well to, to make it feel like there's a connection. But here, it really, truly feels connected. It doesn't feel like, oh, we're going to pluck this thing and put it on the screen to... to try to tie into past Star Trek. Here it feels like it's a natural progression. You would expect it to be there. And it, it mm -hmm. you feel like I'm back in this time period again. Yep. And it works well. While we're talking about ships, you mentioned that they still look a little bit like the Kelvin ships. I I maybe a little bit, but I feel like a lot of that feeling has less to do with the ship designs at this point and more to do with the lighting. 
especially the exterior lighting and mm-hmm. yeah. the, the visual there's, effects. Yeah. There's still a lot more lens flares. Right, um, right. Yeah. But, and, and everything, like, I would say, too, is is a lot shinier inside. I mean, there's no carpeting. Everything yeah, is, yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah, is yeah. super shiny. So there, yeah. there, there's all of that. But I think even just like you said, like having the Lacars and everything mm-hmm. back, I think – and and two, just the kind of the beauty shots they were giving to mm-hmm. us of the ships. It's like it was more in in line with what we have known from Star yeah, Trek for all these right. years because yep. this is one of the things that fans love. We love starships. You know, it, it, that's why they call it starship porn, right? Like we we love mm-hmm. looking at these ships and modeling these ships and all that stuff. So I think this just felt like. It's it's weird because this season almost feels like a redo in the sense of, okay, we know season one wasn't great, and it and it's like they're taking some story elements from that, but this season really kind of almost feels like its own thing in many ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have a more positive feeling on season one, I think, than you do. I think your feeling for season one is kind of like. It was okay. It wasn't bad. It wasn't great. It was just not quite your cup of Earl Grey, right? Well, I would say that season one started off with promise uh, Mm -hmm. and then just kind of became what I felt like was a narrative mess. They could not quite figure out where they wanted to go with the story. And and they just kind of shoved a lot of different things together that I just didn't feel like really resolved well. Mm -hmm. I also think that when we're talking about like this episode, it feels more like 24th century Trek. It's hopeful. Yeah, it does. It feels like the Federation is not a place that we hate anymore. It's actually a place to be celebrated. You know, um, synthetics are left, are back. Everybody seems to be just like this feels more like the 24th century that we left when Voyager ended. All of mm-hmm. those years ago when yeah, TNG and, and Deep Space Nine ended. And again, I, I have to say personally, thank them for that, because mm-hmm. I appreciate that this feels like a place again, that if we're going to go through this whole thing of time travel and trying to save the future, this feels like a, a future worth saving. Whereas episode or season one really didn't feel like a a, a future I wanted to save anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like season one started in the environment that we're seeing now where things were hopeful and the Federation was the Federation that we had known. But because of the attack on Mars and what happened, then the story that we actually got was was this. The 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 side point of that, though, is that you, you do have the situation of the Romulan a homeworld mm-hmm. being destroyed and the need to evacuate the Romulans. But but there you're, you are seeing, naturally you're, you're seeing some dissent within Starfleet. You And on mm-hmm. Earth, you do have people asking, well, why would we help the Romulans? They're our enemies. But in Picard, you see that hopeful Star Trek vision of, well, because we're the Federation, because we're Starfleet, we should help. That's our duty. So you did have all that positive feeling at the beginning of season one, but... But the story that we got in season one, of course, was um, a darker one. Right. And like you said, it did start off with great promise. But then as it went on, I also, I didn't like the season as it progressed as much as I liked the first three episodes. Mm -hmm. But overall, I enjoyed the story. Like you said, there were parts of the narrative that didn't connect. I thought what was going on on the artifact with the uh, Romulan t- brother and sister, or whatever that was going on, didn't connect very well. And then mm-hmm. the the resolution with the creature coming through the rift in the, in space to come and destroy everything felt very formulaic. Mm-hmm. And so you know that yeah. part I, I wasn't as crazy about. But overall, I I still quite enjoyed the season. But jumping to this one. I'm just saying all that not to review the first season, but just to set up where we are at this point. I think you're right about the feeling that we're getting here. What's happening at Starfleet 
Academy, for example, feels very bright. It feels like Starfleet has found its feet again and is moving in the direction that we were accustomed to through most of Star Trek in the past, especially the next generation uh, DS9 minus the war that that was mm-hmm. going on and then where Voyager was. And and Picard felt hopeful again too, like when he's giving his speech mm-hmm. to the cadets, felt very hopeful. We had the moment of having the first fully Romulan cadet, which kind of reminded me of Nog being the first yep. Ferengi cadet, you know, th- these types of things. And there were lots of moments like that that were peppered in that felt like homages to past Star Trek in very subtle ways mm-hmm. where if you're a fan and you and you know all of this stuff, there are these little payoffs even in just in this first episode. And if you don't know that stuff, no problem. Doesn't affect the yep. story at all. Still works great. Yeah, I feel like, you know, in many ways this season has less effing hubris and more <laughs> yeah. joyful hope. Like it just feels different. And again, I'm not complaining at all. I think that's an absolutely wonderful thing. And I'm so glad that they have hey, have chosen to go this way. And I, I do think that it's also wise because I, I do think that if we were in a place where the Federation felt like the place of effing hubris we would we would um we would care less about whether or not Picard was going to save the future mm-hmm. throughout the the season and so yeah i just really appreciate where we are here and and i'm 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 liking it a lot what did you think chris about the way in which some of our main characters have moved on especially rios who has i mean i want I mean, we had an incredible book by John Jackson Miller about Rios, but I want this book about him like moving from, you know, being the captain of La Serena to moving to being back in Starfleet. I feel like this is a, would be an incredible story to to hear because this is a this is a big move for this character who mm-hmm. was so cynical, so broken by what had happened to him and it feels as though he's almost been reborn yes but i like the fact that he didn't lose the characteristics that make him yes. who he is yes right? like the cigar well the cigar is really funny i just the fact that on a 25th century this is the very beginning of the 25th century a 25th century starship the captain can smoke <laughs> on the bridge is really uh, an interesting I mean, it sounds like touch. a heck of a job to me, Chris. Like, I'm all for it. I feel like in some ways that cigar is like his security blanket. Mm-hmm. New on the job. Uh, he, I, I feel like it's less about smoking. It's more about having the thing in his hand mm-hmm. or in yeah. his mouth. It's like the writing crop for uh, Captain Styles, right? Uh, yeah, right. Exactly. That's right. Um, so, and there are a lot of nice Excelsior references in here. Just a side one, because yeah. we probably won't get to it, and that reminded me of it. I love the moment when Rafi shows up on the view screen just for a moment and says, Excelsior standing by to assist. Yep. It was just like Sulu in The Undiscovered yep. Country. We stand by to assist. Yep. Wording was slightly so different, but I- I'm certain that had to have been a callback, a reference. To oh, hundred percent. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. I, I I agree with you. That was great. But talking about Rios, uh, apart from the cigar, his demeanor, his way of speaking, his way of approaching the situation is just different from most of the Starfleet captains that we've seen in the past. Maybe a, a little bit of Riker I could see in there, but for the most part, he's more. He's serious. He's covering all of his bases, but he's less stiff, a little bit more laid back than what we're accustomed to with Starfleet captains. And so that's part of what I mean when I say that I'm Mm -hmm. glad he didn't lose the characteristics that make him who he is, even though he's now back in Starfleet, he's a captain and he's leading the charge in this situation. 
I mean, he is a little bit like Riker in Lower Decks. One, two, three! <laughs> <laughs> Next thing you know, he's going to pull out a trombone or something. Um, no, I, I agree with you. I, I think the the beauty there is that you can tell that this man understands what it means to be a captain. And yeah, you can tell he's he is, had the experience before yes, in Starfleet. Yes. He's just dusting um, it off. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But he does have, I think, a looseness to him. You know, mm-hmm. like he, he um, uh, you can tell he was somebody that you would want. He reminds me a little bit of, it's like if Riker and, and Archer had a baby because of the way that <laughs> like Archer was really kind of loose with his crew. He knew everybody okay, by name. Okay. You know, Rio seems to be that same type of character and type of person who he's very involved with getting to know his crew, treating them all like human beings, you know, um, really caring about them. Uh, and their lives and all that kind of stuff. And and I think, too, specifically, if we can figure out what the size of the, the Stargazer is. I mean, if it's mm-hmm. a smaller ship, too, it makes sense that you would have a tighter net crew, most likely. Um, it's not as small as the NX-01, of course, but it's, no, it's no, not a galaxy-class no. starship either. Right, yeah. right. So, no, I, I like that. I, I And, and I, I mean, I, I thought the whole cigar thing was hysterical, and, and it just kind of made me i think that the thing about it is it helped you realize that yes he's back in starfleet but there's still an irreverence to him that starfleet was never going to beat out of him which is kind of great it's kind of what makes us Mm -hmm. like him as a character and so i think they took everything i loved about that character because he was actually my favorite character in the first season and they've made him even more likable here and so uh i'm i'm excited to to have him back and you know, see where that goes. Yeah, I like how they handled the setup of him being a Starfleet captain again, because at the beginning, when we see the La Serena and we see Seven and we see the Emmett holograms, the first time we watch, we are thinking maybe he's still there too on that ship. Right. Right. And even when we don't see him, we only see the holograms. We still don't imagine he's a Starfleet captain again. You know, we don't know still where he is. So I think that having that early in the episode was a nice way of, of, mm-hmm. I started to say throwing us off the trail, throwing us off the scent. It's not like we were expecting him to be a Starfleet captain in the first place, but it at least made us think one thing might be going on. And then mm-hmm. we're surprised to see him in the captain's chair. So yeah. I thought the creative setup was good. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I'm right there with you in that. I, I think it is a really strong part of the episode. So what did you think about the Android Tour of the Galaxy dinner party? Uh, wh- what did she mean by we've been touring the galaxy? <laughs> uh, well, um, I thought that was a little bit strange. Um, obviously, what was most interesting is that they were with a group of Deltons, Mm-hmm. Uh, which, you know, we've only seen one Delton and spent any time with them. Uh, and that's yeah. in the motion picture, really. Right. So so I thought that was fun. I, I think it, it'll be interesting to see how they tie into this season at all. Mm-hmm. Because, but it did kind of make sense that they would be on this kind of whirlwind tour of the Federation when most of the Federation, you know, A couple years ago, there was a ban on synthetics, right? And people were afraid of them. And I think it sounds almost as if they are on a goodwill tour to... Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe so, yeah. Rehabilitate the, um, you know, the attitudes towards synthetics. Yeah. And to help people get comfortable with them again. And there are so many different opportunities. And and to see, you know, know, Girardi with them was kind of interesting. She's not my favorite character, but... Yeah, that was um, interesting. I'm just not sure how they fit into the rest of the season for sure because, um, you know, they're not on the ship then. And so who's going to get transplanted into the alternate timeline, you know, is uh, who knows? Yeah. Except the writers. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Well, well, Q is involved, so... People can be transported into the alternate timeline, even yep. if they're not there yes. on Earth or at the point of the anomaly, and they can find their way there. So they can kind of do anything they want with the writing. I think you're probably right about the Goodwill tour. 
and trying to repair any damage that's done to the image of synthetics at that point. Plus the fact that, you know, the synthetics that we're talking about here are not the synthetics that people were scared of. These are much more advanced and people might be even more frightened. So it would make sense for them to go around and kind of make first contact in a sense with people so that they uh, feel more comfortable. That makes sense. I I felt like maybe the scene was one of one of the few attempts to tie into the previous season for the viewer and make that connection because Mm -hmm. like you have said this season it's almost like a fresh start you know you could watch this season without having seen the first season and be at no disadvantage i think yeah no i agree with you and and i think one of the really big things that I'm interested in is the fact, okay, so we have this Borg ship, you know, that comes out of this rip in the space-time continuum. And the queen comes to the stargazer, transports through their shields, and starts to assimilate the stargazer, thereby allowing her to control the entire armada that is there because of the Borg enhancements these ships have had. She says they want peace, but first she requires power. And then Picard blows up the ship, and we end up in an alternate timeline with Q. And I'm so interested now to see how all of this is going to play together, because... It does almost seem like from the preview that Picard and the Queen may have to join forces to correct the timeline and thereby healing the rift between humans and Borg possibly. Maybe that's where this is going. I don't know. But I'm just really interested to kind of see where this all goes and how this ties together. Because again, for me, that was one of the things where... The first season didn't quite gel together the Mm -hmm. way I would hoped it would. And here, we're seeing pretty much every single time travel trope and Mm -hmm. phrase that can be used all in an an instant. And so, I'm really wondering how this is all going to play together. And will it feel like more than just one more time travel story? Mm-hmm. And will that focus then on Picard and who he is and his growth be the thing that is the catalyst really for all of this? So I don't mm-hmm. know. I, I mean, as much as I love this episode, I can't honestly sit here and talk about it with you without saying there are some reservations that I'm having. Part of that comes from the history of the most recent Trek shows and part of that just comes from like this was so good. I I continually I want it to continue to be good, but I'm I'm not I'm not sure whether I've, I should hold my breath yet. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm with you on that. And when the first teaser came out and the poster art came out, the key art, my initial feeling was ah, uh, like it looks interesting, but is it going to be another? time travel story. We've got to go fix the past. You know, is it going to be like future's end? Is it going to be like past tense? Is it going to be first contact type situation yet again? Because it kind of feels like all of those put in a blender. It does. It does. And I think you and I maybe talked about this a little bit behind the scenes back then when the first teaser came out. But this episode gives me hope that the story is going to be somewhat different than that because this episode I thought was done so well. But we Mm -hmm. talked a lot here today about the hopeful future and that feeling and Starfleet and how everything is. And that was all wonderful in this episode, but that's not what we're going to be getting for the whole season because we're going back to 2024 Los Angeles. And we don't know yet if we'll be jumping back and forth through time or if we're going to be in 2024 Los Angeles for the entire Mm -hmm. story. We don't know these things yet. So we don't know. 
I will say that at the end of the episode, if I watched it once locally here in Japan on Amazon, and then I rewatched it on Paramount Plus, the US feed. And what was at the end of the Paramount Plus one, which most of our listeners probably watched, that we didn't have on Amazon is the little teaser for the season, like what's coming up, where we get to see scenes of what's going to be happening. And those scenes, because the Earth is a totalitarian world at that point, or at least the United States is, doesn't look like it's going to be that hopeful vision of the future, but the right. hopeful aspect of it will be Picard and our heroes trying to restore everything and bring back the hopeful nature. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how it'll play you, out, yeah. and I don't need it to be like bright and cheery all the way through, but I also hope that it doesn't fall into the apocalyptic, pessimistic trap mm -hmm. that so much of modern television has fallen into. Yeah, I think that's a really, really good way to put it, and I do think that you've really summarized well kind of what some of my reservations at the moment are mm -hmm. just to, from what we have seen and you know I, I mean it is interesting because you know Q shows up and he says that the trial never ends and that this is the very end of the road not taken and I'm right. wondering is that are we referring to tapestry at that point of the road not taken and that like this is the very end of what that universe would have looked like Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, well, but why would we have to go back to 2024 for that to be the case? So that, I mean, it, it, there's just a lot of questions right now. And honestly, you know, this will, this part of the episode will be moot in 10 weeks or whatever when this season's yeah, done. Right, right, right. But it, I, I do think that this episode has done a very good job of kind of rekindling my enjoyment and love for uh, good Star Trek. And I think that at least this episode feels like it really, truly honors the spirit of trying to explore the character to whose name this show mm -hmm. is named after. And so yeah. I'm, I'm really looking forward to that hopefully being kind of the crux of the season more than the yeah. time travel crazy. Right. Well, that's going to be the challenge, right? Because I feel like they set everything up in this first episode with Picard and Laris, Picard's flashback to his mother, the conversation he had with Guinan, the conversation he had with Rafi. They set it all up for this to be an exploration of the character. But the visuals, everything that we're seeing about what's coming up, feels like the focus is going to be on saving mm -hmm. the world. And so we'll see. Now, Star Trek historically has been able to mm -hmm. balance that. And hopefully they'll be able to do it here. Yeah, no. Is there something in that, Chris, where that in 2024 something happens to which makes the road not taken timeline happen? So that Picard's family is different, so he has less of this drive. Maybe that's it. I don't know. It's possible. Yeah, that's possible. Uh, related to that, I had some thoughts on what you were asking about tapestry, for example. Now, I've seen someone say that, oh, in media, oh, Picard season two is a sequel to Encounter at Farpoint. Because from the trial, and and... Q mentions the trial, of course, in this episode at the end when he tells Picard that the trial never ends. But because an encounter at Farpoint, we know that 21st century Earth is not a great place, that this season of the series is a sequel to Encounter at Farpoint. But you bring up Tapestry, which I think is quite interesting because I didn't think too much about Tapestry in detail about how it would play out, but I actually did have the same thought that you had. And it happened when Picard sees that painting of himself on the wall near the end of the episode, which I'm actually using as my background here, as we record today for our video uh, that you and I do together. But Picard in that painting, something about it reminded me of 
tapestry, whether it's his face or the style of the uniform, the throwback. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure it's meant to, but it just popped in my head. And I think you have a really good point that if Picard had lived the alternate life that we saw in Tapestry, many things could have gone wrong for the Federation without him there to lead them. Now, of course, you could say, well, someone else would have stepped up. Someone else would have been the great leader. And that may be true. But if there's something unique about each of us, if there's something special about each of us, as so many people would hope to believe, then no one else would have done exactly the things that Picard did Mm -hmm. in key moments Yes, that allowed the Federation to survive some of the threats that Mm -hmm. we have seen play out. So that's a good point. You know, it very well could tie into Tapestry. Again, that that road not taken was the whole point of Tapestry and what Q was trying to teach Picard. So maybe it could also refer to the road not taken by humanity as a whole. Yeah, absolutely. The which absolutely. is which is I think the most likely thing is that it refers to that and it refers to Picard in some way. It refers to both. I think it's not one or the other. As far as going back to 2024 specifically, I think that's probably just a reference to the world that we're living in today because totalitarian tendencies are active all around the world, including in the United States. And it's that science fiction cautionary tale of here's what could happen to the world and setting it very close to where we are right now is a way of kind of hammering that point home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I don't think it's a direct commentary on things that have happened Mm -hmm. the past few years, but I think that in a science fiction sense, in a broader sense of it being a warning, it is the -hmm. reason for 2024 specifically. But Picard has the line that Q went back and turned our world into a totalitarian Mm -hmm. regime, right? So... This is another one of those Q tests, like creating the anomaly, although technically Picard created the anomaly in all good things. But Q allowed Mm -hmm. it to happen to change the past, to create a challenge for Picard. And so I think here, Q did something to allow society to take a totalitarian path instead of the one that leads to the Federation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's another test for Picard. And your question about the Borg and Picard, the Borg Queen and Picard working together is interesting because I've also heard talk here and there in recent months about, I think from from comments from the creators, I would say, about how season three is a game changer. And it's sort of like a game changer for Star Trek as a franchise. Star Trek universe. And there's speculation that maybe not this story because season three may be its own totally standalone story. But I'm thinking there could be bleed over with the Borg here into what some of the talk is about season three being a way of bringing the Star Trek timelines back together and kind of re not resetting the franchise, but maybe reuniting the franchise. Yeah, I've, could be. I've just heard these stirs about this being a possibility. And it could be that Picard, formerly Locutus, and the Borg Queen have to work together. And the result of it could be that humanity's timeline is restored. The Federation is restored to what we see at the beginning of this episode but also the Borg are restored in some way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, so, I mean, it's interesting. I think Many in all of that, paths. that it could absolutely be what they do. And I do, I do think Chris, that we could probably both agree that it will be a travesty if Picard and Laris are not together by the end of the season. Right. Now, do you think 
that there will be an episode this season. This one is called The Star Gazer, a play on something from the past. Do you think there'll be an episode this season called We'll Always Have Laris? <laughs> I hope so. If, <laughs> if that's not the case, then they have not done their job. Right. <laughs> If not, you need to get Kirsten on the horn and ask her, what happened? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It was right there. It was so easy. It was right in front of you. But yeah, I, I'm sure this is not the last we've seen of Laris. I just can't believe that all she would have is this little moment at the beginning of this episode. Uh, I think actually that, that that tension, that pull of a potential relationship there between them is somehow going to be a key part of Picard. Mm-hmm exploring the inner workings of himself and and uh, the resolution to at least the personal aspect of the story. Absolutely. Well, and I think that it's interesting to, you know, many fans like myself, obviously I, I'm a huge fan of Beverly Crusher as a character and to give us a character to which, you know, fans could root for Picard ending up with in the season uh, I think is really, really interesting. And um, I I like that because I, I also, again, if this is about the promise of Picard moving on in a way in his life that he's never been able to do before. And so again, kind of putting that promise out there, I think is something that it's basically Chekhov's gun, right? But this is Picard's relationship and we, we need that, I think, to pay off in the end. Right. And him ending up with a Romulan is a great payoff for the character going all the way back into the next generation because of all humans, of all Starfleet officers, he was one of the most receptive to trying to make things work Mm -hmm. with the Romulans, trying to have a good relationship with the Romulans. And then, of course, in season one, he led the evacuation of the Romulans and or he did prior to that. And would be a great payoff. It would make a lot of sense. Excellent point. We're, one quick point as we get ready to wrap up here soon. Were you surprised that there was really only one reference to the fact that Picard is a synthetic life form at this point, that he is an android now? I'm wondering if, if, if that was because this is something to which not everybody is aware of. You know, yeah, that I, Picard, this is, this, you know, I mean, it's a kind of a personal thing. And so there are a few people who were there and they know what happened. And yeah. the rest of the world uh, or the universe just thinks of Picard as being Picard. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. When you first said that, I thought you were speaking of the viewers, people who didn't see season one. And so they don't know. <laughs> but actually, yeah, you mean people in universe. And yes, yes. I, I, I guess I kind of assumed that because he's Admiral Jean-Luc Picard, that it would have been huge news and everybody would know what happened. But actually, you're probably right. It's a personal thing. And so probably some people know, but it's private information and most people just Mm -hmm. see him as the same Picard. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. You're probably right. Yeah. Uh, but, But I think it's interesting for the storytelling because we were wondering when season one ended, we were wondering where's the story going to go? What's going to happen now that Picard has a new lease on life in a sense? Of course, his body's going to age fairly naturally and and he'll die, but he's in better condition than he was before yep, he got absolutely. the synthetic body. So what's going to happen? And it seems that the answer is probably not much. It's just a side note that he's artificial at this point Mm -hmm. and it's not going to be a real part of the story yeah yeah no i i think that's the case and and again it'll be really interesting to kind of uh see how this all progresses i mean there's lots of different ways that they can go with all of it and i think you know i mean i guess i've had to give this season or opener a rating uh, to me, this is this is four point five out of five. Uh, you know, and especially, I think anybody who's listened to the network, you, well aware of the fact that I haven't loved a lot of the the new track that we've been getting, except for Lower Decks, which I'm a massive fan of. Um, and in many ways, this 
episode opener for season two felt much like I rem- like lower decks in the sense that it feel felt it feels like it's celebrating everything we love about Star Trek while mm-hmm. at the same time, you know, pushing this character and and forward into a place w- that he's never been. So absolutely excited uh, to continue with season two and, and just crossing my fingers that it, it continues on this trend. Yeah, yeah. Character is going to be key to this not feeling like mm-hmm. we're taking favorite moments of past Star Trek and mashing them together. A thousand percent. What would we say? Kit bashing a story? <laughs> I guess. Hey, well, kit yeah. bashing time travel? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But but the setup was great. And I, I like the little homages. Uh, the fact that they bring back these older starship names for new ships. Yes. And they also bring back older security protocols. You can blow up the ship by just saying zero, 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 destruct zero. One of the mm-hmm. easiest bank codes ever. Yes. <laughs> but- do not use that as your bank code, by the way. <laughs> Don't do it. Or your Twitter password. Yeah. <laughs> Hacked. But, <laughs> but there's so many wonderful touches in this episode. And, you know, seeing Guinan again was great. I love the little explanations. Yes. I love that they did for Q kind of what they did for Luke in the Book of Boba Fett and the Mandalorian, where he's young for a moment. But mm-hmm. then I love how Q ages himself to match Picard. Yes. And I love Guinan's explanation as for why she looks older now, even though she's an El Orion. And Yeah, that was nice. The fact that the writers acknowledge that the actors are aging, but they don't try to come up with overly convoluted explanations. And they also don't just mm-hmm. completely ignore it, you know, I think is right. good. Yeah, and- it's it's kind of like both of those things reminded me of when Worf was like, there is a story, and You're we right. do not talk about it. That's exactly what I thought of. Right. Or when he shows back up in the movies, and like it's a long story. Yeah, right? just, exactly. <laughs> we don't need I mean, to explain. we ain't got time for that, Chris. Yeah, the writers are just saying, we know this doesn't make sense. We're going to just acknowledge that it doesn't make sense, but we're not going to try to yes. explain it. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, there's so much to love in this episode, and visually it's beautiful, beautifully produced while retaining the feel of the past Star Trek that we've been missing. But with the modern production values on television, I loved. So there's a lot more we could talk about, but we don't want to make this too long. So I'm sure we'll talk about some specific topics later on in future episodes, Matthew. So for now, I'll give it eight flirting Deltons as my rating. Nice. (laughs) All right. Well, everyone, we would love to hear your thoughts on The Stargazer and Picard Season 2, where you think the story is going to go. Anything that you'd like to share about this episode and the series, we'd love to hear from you. There are many ways for you to share your thoughts. The best way to talk to us and fellow listeners is to go to Facebook and join the Babel Conference. That's our closed listeners group. If you're already a member, you know what to do. If you're not, just type Babel, B-A-B-E-L into the search field, and it should come right on up. If not, just type the whole name, The Babel Conference. It is a closed group just for listeners. So if you join, please answer the questions and agree to the rules of the forum so that I can let you in. You can also find us on Twitter. Our username is TrekFM. That's our username everywhere in social media, Instagram, and elsewhere. We'd love to hear from you there. And you can also send us email if you'd like. Just go to our website, trek.fm slash contact, and use the form you find there. Choose to send to a show and choose Interface or the Artificial Tango. And that'll come to Matthew and me. And we'd love to hear your thoughts. And again, if your podcast app of choice allows you to leave ratings and reviews, we'd love to get those from you as well. Now, Matthew, when you're not getting ready for your own tour of the Federation, you know, just to make sure that everybody is positronically positive about you. Where can people find you? 
Well, Chris, when that's not happening, uh, of course, you can find me all over social media, which still exists here in the 21st century uh, under Matt Rushing 2 Instagram, Letterbox, Twitter, Vero, all of those places. Uh, you can also find me here on the network. Uh, we've got a whole other side of the network called the 602 Club, where we talk about all of those fandoms outside of Star Trek. Uh, so check that out. There's some bonus shows in there as well, which John Mills and I have been doing. So I hope you'll really enjoy all of that. And then... Chris, we are doing the Orb as well as Literary Treks and Warp 5 here on the network. So the Orb's about Star Trek Deep Space Nine, as we mentioned. We're big Niners. So if you want to hear our conversations about Cisco, you can go there. Uh, Literary Treks is about the books and the comics of Star Trek. And Warp 5, we've been celebrating 20 years of Enterprise by walking through every single episode. So you can check all of those out. And then on the Nerd Party, I have a couple of shows. One is a completed show I did with Drea Kaufman. And that is called Owl Post. We talked about every single chapter of the Harry Potter series, one chapter at a time. And then last but not least, doing aggressive negotiations with John Mills as we talk about Star Wars each and every week. But Chris, if people, you know, maybe they want to catch up with you and just see how life is going there on the La Sorrenta as you try and deal with just the one hologram now, where can they find you? Yeah, I put Emmett to work. He's doing my editing for me, my writing. He's doing design work for me now. He's quite busy. So I have plenty of time to talk. If you'd like to hit me up on Twitter, my username is C Brian Jones, letter C and Brian with a Y. That's my username everywhere in social media, but Twitter is where I'm most active. And then you mentioned elsewhere on the network, you and I are talking Enterprise 20th anniversary on Warp 5 with our rewatch. Talking Deep Space Nine with you on the Orb. Larry Nemechek and I do The Ready Room from time to time. And I drop by Literary Treks now and then. And you can find me in many, many episodes of many shows in the back catalog. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on all the things we've discussed. Star Trek, whatever you want to talk about. So again, you can find me everywhere as C. Brian Jones. Now, if you would like to help us keep this show and all the other shows we've mentioned and the network as a whole going, we could definitely use your help through Patreon. We are working on building an assortment of new things for the network, and we really do need your support to keep everything going and moving forward. So if you'd like to find out how to help, please visit patreon.com slash trekfm. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trekfm to find out how. And I want to send a huge thank you to everyone who's helping us now. We could not do this and could not keep this going without you. So thank you so very, very much. Well, Matthew, this was exciting. We get to talk about something that we don't normally talk about together, a new show, Star Trek Picard. And I am ready to head down to Los Angeles 2024, find out what's going on. So I'm looking forward to doing that with you next time. Chris, make it so. Recording. Ah, oh, Laris's lovely Romulan Irish sounding pants. <laughs> oh, the pants have an Irish sound to them. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Uh, uh, which uh, I'm not going to lie to you, completely in love with that woman now. She's amazing. So, yeah, one of my favorite characters from Picard yeah, as well. It's great. All right, here we go. <laughs>